Looking back on the podcast we just recorded, one thing I found is how we didn't really talk about how gender factors into film so often. And I kind of wanted to talk more about Kino's journey, so I think this would be a good place to do it. And I'll also have broader thoughts later, too. Because one of the things that... Uh, let's start with anime. Because when I first got into anime through Satoshi Kon and Miyazaki and through Kino's journey, I was fooled into thinking it was this progressive place for female characters because all the... Because people like Kon and Miyazaki and Kino's journey are these really progressive, really feminist shows and how they have these really great female characters. And then I learned about all of these really odd uh, Japanese cult, these Japanese genres, and I go, ooh, ooh, there are some problems here. But to, to go back to the broad, and to go to Kino's journey, I think one thing that makes it so successful, I think so fascinating to me, is how gender never even factors in the show. Garrett, even a lot of people who watch it, don't even realize Kino's a girl until the fourth episode. They don't even, they don't even, it doesn't even cross their mind. And which I think that's why she, I think she is my favorite female character, my, fam my favorite female protagonist. Because she is a character beyond anything else. It never, gender doesn't even come up because any, any other show would bring up things of gender, would bring up things of gender and how, oh, things are swamped and she's holding up her femininity and or whatever that might be. Or they try to masculinize her. In, any, in a way, just sort of to remove previous stigmas. But no, Kino is a character that doesn't even come into the equation. And she does, she's not completely, and I don't, I want, I don't want to say she's a quite a masculine role, because she does some, because I think, I just don't think it just, it, it doesn't even cross her mind that she both, she uses both forms of both feminine and masculine ways to describe herself. When people call her a boy, she corrects them. But when people call her miss, she said, don't do that. I'm Kino. So it's it's kind of a show that has this very it's it's very much in the subtext. The show is not about this, but I think I think I read an article that was I think it was this little blog post and it said Kino's journey. It's not about gender, so it's all about gender. And I think that's one a really positive thing about this show, and it's one it's one of these things I really want to spread this show some more because I think this is a really positive female character, a really positive role model, and by making no no fuss about it. I think that makes it all the stronger. So let's go into more into the show in general. This right now is just going to be a platform to meet for me to talk more about Kino's journey. Because I cannot exaggerate how much I love this show. I love everything about this show. I love its characters. I love its ideas. I love its philosophy. I love its animation. I love its color work, its line work. I love how the whole thing has VR scan lines as a filter to give this idea that you're looking through a medium, which is really central to some of the the show's central ideas. I love how we have a character who is both very, very well defined in her worldview and her philosophy and her temperament, but who we also know very little about. I think I've said this in the podcast proper is that we never learn her real name. We never really know much about her past. We know she was trained, and we even see who trained her. But we never see that training in detail. We never know what it was, how long it was. We don't even know how old she is. I mean, people... I mean, it's... The voice... The people who voice Kino sound considerably older than that design, and Kino acts a lot older than that design would intend, which that design looks like a 15-year-old girl. But the her actions and her temperament seem very different from any fifteen year old girl. Which when you which you know when you see her past, that might be a proper thing. But I just wanted to talk more about why I think the show is so successful, because there are other things like how the philosophy of the show is fascinating, and how every single town or they're more or less towns. They're called countries in the show. More or less, they're kind of city-states. They're kind of only these towns. And each of them are these really exaggerated and anachronistic 
visions of certain aspects of humanity. Like there's one that takes on capitalism, another one that takes on, um, yeah, one episode that very clearly takes on capitalism. One ep in that same episode, we see world that takes on pure democracy and the death penalty. We see worlds that take on the roles of religion and just broad tradition, what it means to get rid of your leader, what it means to have a national identity, what it means, another but there's on one of the, their episodes, it means what it means to be a piece of art, which is, it's a very meta episode where they look at the nature of books and what it means to be sucked into a book. So I think it's a film of very fascinating philosophical tales. And I think the reason why it works so well is because it's so balanced. It's a show that presents these ideas, but it lets you make the decision. It, it's a show that requires your input, that requires you to think, which I think is so essential for this kind of story, for this kind of tale. So I can't really think of another show that that is so balanced, it's so ambiguous, that in every single way it makes you think, who did do the right thing? Who was right in this? It doesn't really lean in any direction. I suppose Kino is the only one where they think, yeah, she's kind of doing the right thing. But even then, the show makes great efforts, particularly in the second episode that I made, The Guys Watch. That's one where you really think, holy shit, did she do the right thing? Was this a proper thing to do? Especially in... And she doubts it herself. And this is never a show that says, that person is a good person. That person is a hero. Because I've heard some people call Kino a heroine. And I don't want to call her a heroine. Because while she is ne she's never a villain, and I would never call her an anti, and I would never call her an anti-hero, because she does, seem, she does seem very human. She seems to be full of humanity. She seems, she seems to be a very warm personality. So she doesn't really strike the anti-hero mold. But there's certain actions she takes and certain things, decisions she makes and a certain temperament to her. Like, she is so cold and emotionless sometimes. And how and when she does show emotion, it's just very brief and very out there. And she sort of regrets having emotion. Some have lent her to theorize that that's a, sen that's a sign of trauma, that this is a character dealing with trauma in her own way. But some of her actions make you think, ooh, ooh, what a... Ooh, is this, was this the right thing to do? And the show says, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. That's for you to decide. It's the show that's bathed in a wonderful ambiguity. And I just can't recommend the show enough. I think it's a show that is successful in everything it does. I mean, some, show, some episodes are better than others, like any TV show. And it is uh, disappointingly short. There is so much more. You, there was so much more they could have done. There was so many. You could do anything with this show. Because it's so broad and open. And because it's so episodic, you just keep making more. And they've kind of done that. They've been sort of off. Like there's like an episode zero and two kind of specials they made for TV. But it's a show I think that's really... I, want, I, don't, I don't want to say it's cut in its prime. But it's something... There's much more you can do with this. And some other people have taken to that. Some people have written, like, mangas and other things like that. The, the, the story of Kino's journey is far from over. But it's a show that's just... I watched a few months ago, and it grabbed me. Like, nothing else I could think of. It grabbed me. And I am not an anime fan, as much as it seems like how I push Miyazaki on that... Sh uh, Miyazaki and some anime things on that show. I am not an anime fan. Outside of Khan, Miyazaki, and Kino's journey, I can take or leave most of it. So I think it's strange that one of my favorite shows, one of these things that just grabbed me so much, is anime. And I think it's kind of disappointing that we've labeled anime as a subgenre and a subculture at that. And I think that does... I think that's... And that stigmatizes this this genre, this media, it stigmatizes an entire nation's worth of culture. And I hate how that happens. Because I'll show people this and they go, well, I don't like anime. What, you don't like animation? You, don't, you just don't like TV? Or you just don't like movies? That's such a broad statement. Why would you do that? Why would you say that? It's because we've, st we've stymied it through a subculture and a... Uh, and we we call it a genre, which it isn't. Animation in general is not a genre. 
And I'm so disappointed in how we people within that community compare itself to each other. They treat it like an island when it's not. And if there's anything I'm trying to get through this show and through these episodes and through these talks is that film is not an island. It will never be an island. It can never be an island. As much as you can look at it like that, as much as you can see it as that, film is far more powerful and far more useful when it is treated as part of culture, as part of history, as a part of us, of the story of humanity, we can look at, at films from the past and think that's what we were, that's what we wanted to see. You see, it's, Kino's journey does this. It makes me all very philo philosophical and broad. So yeah, go watch Kino's journey. Ignore what the other people said. I'm right. They're wrong.